Special thanks to our patron Carlotta. Thank you for the continued support. If you like what you hear, consider subscribing and enjoy. Prologue There was a story I had grown up knowing for most of my entire life without knowing how I knew it. You know how you know a song or a random item of information, but you don't remember where you first heard it? It could be a rumor, some sort of folklore passed on from person to person, a cautionary tale meant to scare you into obedience. This was one of those stories. Years ago, the tale went, a young man had joined the Rothschan army as soon as he was of age. Joining him was his childhood friend and sweetheart, and right before they started their training, she became his betrothed as well. They were to be wed after their training was completed and before they started their military service in earnest. But the girl guarded a dangerous secret. She could wield magic. Somehow she had been able to suppress it and keep her ability hidden for most of her life, which, in the rational country of Rothschan, was a necessity. Here, magic is regarded as suspect and practically evil. Did her intended know? If he did, he must have been too in love with her to care. If he had known, but hadn't turned her into the authorities, or at the very least shunned her and cut off all contact with her, then he would have faced a steep fine, or worse, if his transgression had been discovered. In the final week of their training, it was announced that a person of great importance would be visiting their company. All were expected to be on their best behavior and acquit themselves well, not just because their behavior would be a reflection on their superiors, but also because the visitor would be looking for the best and brightest talent that could potentially be pulled for special assignment. But their superiors needn't have worried. The visitor, the Lord High Seneschal, arrived with the Royal Secretary, and both men were extremely impressed. The Seneschal requested private, one-on-one -on -one meetings with each member of the company, for just a few minutes each, in one of the tents in the center of the company's camp. Nothing seemed amiss as each person went in for their private meeting. Now it was time for the young woman's interview. Her betrothed patiently waited outside for his turn. The midday heat bore down on him, and he stifled a yawn. Time dripped by, until a scream from inside the tent pierced the air. Although the Lord High Seneschal had given strict orders that no one was to interrupt his interviews, indeed, even the royal secretary who had traveled with him was not allowed to be present during these meetings, the young man burst into the tent, protocol be damned. What happened inside the tent, no one knows for sure. Men's voices, raised in the heat of anger, could be heard. The poor young woman, already under duress, may have screamed again. Witnesses later swore that the tent glowed a strange bright white, brighter even than the noon sun that was shining overhead. Then the world grew unnaturally still. As the white glow faded, the young man emerged from the tent, looking a little dazed. In his hand he held a peculiar silver rod, studded with colored jewels that blinked in the sunlight. The man stumbled a few steps away. The Lord High Seneschal threw back the tent flap, ignoring the gasps and cries from the waiting crowd outside. Some murmured about his strange disfigurement, wondering aloud what had happened. Others ran forward, asking, "'Sir, are you all right?' The seneschal waved them all away, leaning heavily on the tent frame as he pointed directly at the retreating young man. The seneschal screamed, "'Arrest that man!' The young man broke into a run. Some of the man's comrades gave chase, but soon found they couldn't move, caught in place by fast-growing vines that had snaked up from the ground to wrap around their bodies. Certainly not natural, Flora." But the other possibility, that these vines were magical constructs, was, obviously, ludicrous and untrue. Others came to cut them free from the plants, but the vines resisted the sharp blades. It would take hours to free them. Anyone else who tried to pursue the man found themselves unable to cross an invisible barrier, as if the air had solidified around their camp and wouldn't let anyone out. Meanwhile, the young man kept running and running, until he was out of sight and well away from his would-be pursuers. People later speculated that the young man must have possessed illegal magic. The silver rod, perhaps? 
and used it against his former friends and the Lord High Seneschal. Although the Seneschal ordered a kingdom-wide search, the man was never captured, and no one ever saw him again. Perhaps he perished in his reckless escape from the camp. But, if by some miracle he lived, I'm sure that no matter how much he ran, or how far he went, he would never truly be safe from himself. Chapter 1 Adeline Adeline! My father's voice broke through my musings. Huh? Is everything all right, Adeline? Father asked me. He followed my gaze to where I had been staring. You looked like you were far away. Or is the peeling wallpaper really that interesting? Oh! I flushed, laughing weakly. <laughs> the wallpaper's fine, Father. Although I think that shade of green went out of style when I was five years old. Well, maybe that can be the first thing we spruce up around here, Father laughed. <laughs> it can be your birthday present. To us. Now I laughed in earnest. <laughs> I'll be happy to fix up this house with my earnings. But I don't think the first thing I'd pick will be the wallpaper. We all laughed, Mother, Father, and I. There were so many things wrong with our house. It would be hard to pick which one to fix first. The leaking roof? The warped wooden floorboards? Not to mention the threadbare, faded furniture that graced each room. But even though our little house was old and falling apart, it was ours. It was where I grew up, just my parents and me, in our home in a village on the outskirts of the Kingdom of Rothschan. A cozy little home for a cozy little family. Father beamed at me as Mother placed a small, homemade raisin spice cake in front of me. The two of them spoke in unison. Happy birthday, Adeline. Thank you. It looks delicious, I said. Father passed me a knife. The handle was a little wobbly, but it was our sharpest blade. I took it from him and began cutting little slices for each of us, passing them around the table. Even though it was my birthday celebration, it was just the three of us as it usually was. Growing up as an only child, I was very close to my parents and didn't mind our small, family-only gatherings for special occasions. This was an important birthday, though. I turned 21 today, which meant that I was now eligible to enlist in the Rothschild military for my mandatory three-year term, after which I would have the option to either continue serving the kingdom or could leave the military and pursue a different vocation. I'm sorry it's not fancier. Mother fretted at me as I accepted the slice of cake. Nonsense, I said. It's perfect. While I'd miss my parents, there were certain things about living at home that I wouldn't miss. Like my mother's constant need for reassurance. She often expressed sadness that we couldn't afford more than the most basic of necessities. It didn't matter to me that our neighbors and my schoolmates were better off than my family was. But for some reason, it mattered a lot to my parents, my mother especially. It wasn't that mother wanted fancy things to show off our non-existent wealth. Honestly, I had never been able to figure out exactly why she cared so much about it. Of course, having more money would have made things easier growing up, but we got by. We had an, admittedly leaky, roof over our heads, and food enough to not be starving. Perhaps if we had been a bit wealthier, mother and father would have had more friends amongst our neighbors, and I would have had an easier time in school. But I had my family, and I tended to keep to myself anyway, so I didn't feel the lack of close friends too much. Usually. Which was why this birthday was so momentous. Being in Rothschild's military meant my parents wouldn't have to worry about my well-being for the three years I was gone, and I would also be earning a regular salary and could send every coin home. I tried to help my family over the years by taking various odd jobs, mostly running errands. But I was never allowed to hire myself out as a servant to any households, even to our nearby neighbors. My mother didn't like the idea of me being away from home for more than a few hours. The idea of working as a live-in servant to another household, even if it was with the wealthiest and most secure residents in all of Rothschild, upset Mother so greatly that, after seeing her reaction to the first time I suggested it, 
made me reluctant to ever bring it up again. So, even though I loved my parents dearly, I was also secretly excited at the prospect of going. Not necessarily because I thought I'd make a good soldier, although the idea of attaining knighthood someday was a bit appealing. But mandatory was mandatory, after all, and mother and father would have to let me go. And after my three years were done, who knew what could happen? I'd most likely stay in the military, as I didn't have many prospects here in Rothschild that I could come back to. Being poor wouldn't have necessarily deterred potential suitors. But, when I had started growing old enough to notice such things, I realized that many of our neighbors were polite, but distant. Coupled with my parents' fierce protectiveness of me, and their reluctance to talk about our lives before I was three, the age that I could recall my earliest memories, and I often felt like I was carrying the weight of their unspoken worry. But, if I was lucky and smart and saved enough money, perhaps I could leave the army after the three years and go see the rest of the gifted lands. I'd had the skills to hire myself out as a guard, or maybe even a mercenary. Although I didn't think I could ever have the mindset of a mercenary. Still, there would be more possibilities and opportunities after my service was done than I had now. As if he read my mind, Father asked, Will you be enrolling tomorrow? I nodded, even as I caught the slight frown on Mother's face. She pushed back a tendril of gray and brown hair behind her ear, a sure sign that she was upset. Mother always grew fidgety when she was uncomfortable. It was her tendency, whenever anyone talked about the Rothschild military, for her to grow quiet. And now that I was at the age of enrollment, she hated hearing me talk about it. I didn't understand why. She knew it was inevitable. I figured it was just because she was afraid of losing her only child. But she needn't worry. The kingdom of Rothschild hadn't been involved in anything that could even be remotely considered a skirmish in years. Our kingdom's reputation was too fearsome. No one would dare go against us. I was confident I would be just fine. As was my father, who smiled at me. The crinkles around his eyes, a testament to his years of hard work filled with equal parts worry and laughter, deepened. We'll miss you. But it can't be helped. And it can only mean better times for all of us. He looked at my mother, who was still and silent. Gently, he said, Let's all go together, to keep today's celebration going. It will be a defining moment for our whole family. Mother met his gaze, and I was surprised to see tears glistening in her eyes. Before I could say anything, Father gave me a warning glance. Don't acknowledge it. In an effort to lighten the mood, Father asked, What were you thinking about earlier, Adeline? Oh, it was nothing, really. Just, do you remember that story that was going around a few years back? About how some crazed person attacked a seneschal at one of the training camps with forbidden magic? And then escaped? The story just came to mind, and I wondered, what ever happened to the seneschal? And did they ever find his attacker? Both mother and father froze at my words. It was like a veil had dropped over their faces shuttering them completely from any emotion. What made you think of that? Father's voice was flat and harsh. Surprised at my father's tone, I stammered, I... I don't know. Probably because I'll be enrolling tomorrow, and then that made me think of that story. It just got me curious, is all. I'm sure it's nothing more than rumor. Mettie Champlin was the one who told me. And you know what a gossip she... Don't speak of that story ever again, Father said. His face was flushed, from anger, but his hands, gripping the sides of his chair, were deathly white. Even if you think it's nothing but rumor, don't talk of it outside these walls. But why eat your cake? Following his own instructions, Father tucked into his slice of cake, barely finishing one bite before shoveling another into his mouth as if he didn't want to be engaged in any more conversation. It's just a story anyway, dear. Pay it no mind. Mother picked up her fork and began eating as well, but slowly, lost in her thoughts. Even her chewing seemed subdued. Unsure of how to respond, 
or even if I should respond, I picked up my own fork and took a bite of my birthday cake. The sweetness of the raisins and brown sugar burst over my tongue. Finishing my bite, I smiled at my mother. Honors to the cook. It's delicious. Perfect, as always, mother. Her answering smile was tinged with sadness. Thank you. After that uncomfortable moment, the rest of my birthday celebration passed pleasantly and without any other incidents. As if by unspoken agreement, my father and I avoided talking about my upcoming military enrollment and instead just conversed about everyday, innocuous topics. Mother relaxed as the night wore on, but I could sense that undercurrent of unhappiness behind all her words and actions. When we had our fill of cake and conversation, I stood up, intending to grab all the dishes from the table and start cleaning up. Mother gently took my dish from my hand. It's your birthday. You shouldn't have to do any cleaning, she said. She paused, putting her hand on my cheek as she regarded me. You have a big day tomorrow. She shooed me away. I laughed and gave her a big hug, then turned to hug my father. All right, then. See you both in the morning. I headed to my room at the back of the house, where my parents' bedroom was just across the hall. Once inside my room, I approached the plain wooden dresser on the far side of the wall and grabbed the pale blue ceramic pitcher that sat atop it, intending to pour some water into the nearby matching bowl so I could wash my face. The pitcher was surprisingly light. Looking inside it, I realized I forgot to refill it after using the last of the water this morning. No matter. I could refill it from the communal bucket of water in the kitchen. I grabbed the pitcher and headed back there. As I approached, I heard my parents talking in low voices. Something about their discussion made me slow my footsteps and approach quietly. They didn't seem to be arguing, but whatever they were talking about definitely had them agitated. You don't know that, Mother was saying as I crept up slowly to the doorway. And you don't know that anything will happen, Pella, Father retorted. Just because it happened once doesn't mean it will happen again. But if it does, I'd rather Adeline is safe at home. If something should happen during her three years away, we'll never know, and we won't be able to help her. What does Mother mean, they'll never know, I thought. Was she talking about me being injured or killed? Of course if that happened, my parents would be informed. But recalling Father's statement, I didn't think my parents were discussing the possibility of me getting hurt. They were talking about something else entirely. Just because it happened once doesn't mean it will happen again. But what did they mean? I was so busy mulling over this, I nearly missed the next part of their conversation. She's made it to her 21st birthday, and so far nothing untoward has occurred. She should be in the clear now, Father said. But look at what happened to Layden, Mother said. Do we really want to risk? There was a rustling sound, as if someone had moved quickly. From somewhere closer, Father said urgently, Do not say his name. It's been long enough. Surely you never know who might be listening. Don't tempt fate. Best to leave the past where it belongs. A choked sob escaped from my mother's lips. The rustling sounded again. I surmised my father was holding my mother. I could hear my mother sniffling quietly, but she quickly got her crying under control. <sniffs> You're right, she said. I'm fretting over nothing. Everything will be fine tomorrow, and beyond that. That's the way to think about it, my father said encouragingly. There was more rustling of fabric, followed by footsteps and the clinking of dishes as my parents walked around the kitchen, tidying it. Under the cover of all their noise, I crept back to my room where I placed the still-empty ceramic pitcher back on top of the dresser. I quietly closed the door behind me and leaned against it, thinking furiously. What was it that my parents were so worried about occurring? And who was Layden? Thanks for listening. This has been the prologue and first chapter of Air of Magic and Mischance, now available on Audible, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, or wherever you like to buy books, ebooks, and audiobooks. If you like what you heard, 
consider picking up a copy anywhere you buy books and leaving a review. Reviews go a long way in helping indie authors. Thank you so much.